You're listening to the ProcureTech Podcast, your weekly show for all that's cooking in the digital procurement space. Yes, we've got the hottest startups, thought leadership and conversation from visionary industry experts and definitely no stiff corporate content. I'm your host, James Meads, procurement pro, digital nomad and ProcureTech fanboy. And now here's this week's show. Yes, hello and welcome to another episode of the ProcureTech podcast. This week we're back again with the ProcureTech pub. If you're not sure what the pub format is, it's a little bit different to our usual podcasts in that these are a series of interviews that I do as LinkedIn live broadcasts with industry experts. They're typically a little bit longer than our average podcast episode. And then I take that and repackage it as audio content that I can put out as a podcast, which is what you're listening to now. My guest on the ProcureTech pub this time is Professor Dr. Florian Kleeman. He is a university lecturer at Munich University of Applied Sciences in Germany. He's also the author of four procurement textbooks in German language and a former consultant. We're talking all about the, the people factor in digital transformation and change management, management in general. And then we will also move on to talk about the people skills and the requirements for procurement teams of the future as they hopefully or definitely will adopt a lot of technology into their organizational structure. So without any further ado, here is this week's show with Florian. Yes, hello and welcome to the ProcureTech Pub. Uh, we are live. I'm joined today by Professor Dr. Florian Kleeman. He is a professor lecturer at Munich University of Applied Sciences or Munich uh, high school? How do you say? You mean university high school? I don't know what the translation is. Uh, anyway, yeah. you can introduce yourself Flo, and university. then we can dive straight into the topic. Yeah, uh, James, thanks for having me. I've been following your your podcast uh, about a year now and I was so glad to meet you in, in Procurement Summit in Berlin this year uh, where we agreed, uh, where, even with some of my students present, um, that I should be guest on your podcast, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion, especially on this topic today. Fantastic. No, looking forward to it too. And the topic is going to be the people factor in change management and digital transformation, which will be the first part of the discussion. And then we will move on to the second part of the discussion, looking at really what are the skills needed and what will be the sort of personal development plans, career plans, uh, change in sort of the whole landscape uh, of procurement teams as procurement 4.0 or industry 4.0 uh, becomes more of a thing in the mainstream. And obviously the workplace is changing and evolving as a result of that. So I think it's going to be really interesting discussion. Looking forward also to see if what sort of questions we might get as well. If anyone is watching this on the live stream, then please pop your questions uh, into, the, in, into the comments and we will pick them up uh, at the end of this. If anyone's listening to this as the podcast, which we're going to be editing and repackaging it as, then obviously you're not able to ask questions, but hopefully uh, you still nonetheless enjoy what we're going to discuss today. So let me dive straight in. So you've described the personnel perspectives for the procurement of the future, and you've put sort of three different scenarios, the wallflower, the robot, or the jack of all trades. Now, I really like that, but maybe... Are they three that can coexist or did you think of that as being sort of three very definitive kind of different buckets that we may go down? Actually, I, I uh, would say it's more like a development path uh, that uh, could be taken on by procurement. I think in, 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 in many ways, uh, procurement, even if we love it, um, still many people see it as a wallflower. And uh, probably this is uh, this is a change of directions, or there's put, uh, two potential scenarios. 
stories for the future if you run down and if you consequently think digitalization to, through through the very end um, then probably procurement in future is more robot driven so to speak and um, the way I hope it's gonna be developing it's the jack of all trades uh, which probably some of us uh, think it's already here right now but um, I think jack of all trades is, is uh, probably the more attractive and more realistic scenario for us. But then I guess the whole jack of all trades, we always say in English, then master of none. Does that then potentially apply to procurement or how are we going to get around this? Because, I mean, certainly procurement in the past has been a career that a lot of people tend to just fall into or, or end up in rather than strategically sort of plan to go into and i know with what with what you do with with your course and a lot of other sort of more academic directions now that procurement can go down it's becoming more of a thing to study procurement especially supply chain as well is jack of all trades maybe underselling the profession i mean i agree i, I agree that we need to be versatile but at the same time you know, there's going to be, especially in the future with all of the technology, there's going to be a lot of specialization too, right? Yeah, I think, uh, James, is a very important point, this one, because uh, I uh, actually, I picked the, the title of the the, the, the presentation we, we're looking at it was more like, a, you know, just an idea that popped off my head. But I think in future, and when we think about professionalization and procurement, how the function develops, I think we are not going to be able to hold on, hold on to this image of probably jack of all trades but i think as, as you just said specialization of different roles different profiles different career pathways is, is more likely to be the future in procurement rather than we really have to do it all write orders um, uh, conduct negotiations develop strategies um, be friends with stakeholders with suppliers be enemy with suppliers at the same time so i'm more uh, relatively certain that we are not going to be jack of all trades but rather with the function developing into a more professional function and as you said getting more attractive a more structured way also of education and, and uh, career pathways into procurement um, hopefully uh, this leads to also more professional uh, human resources work or HR work for procurement. And you mentioned in a presentation that I saw you give recently you mentioned four key areas they were digitalization, innovation, resilience, and agility. I translated that from the German, so I hope it, it's not lost any of its context. Do you see all of them as being equal in importance, or do you think one of them specifically is going to be key? Uh, well, probably since it's a, pro a procurement uh, technology podcast, um, my answer you will not uh, uh, fully endorse, but uh, I'm coming from the direction where, from my impression, over the last five, six, seven years where digitalization as a mega trend has really kicked in. Sometimes uh, people seem to think this is the only direction or the only development procurement is taking. And um, this is why I uh, try to put on a, a diff different perspective. So in my view, digitalization probably is really a um, very important topic for the future of procurement, but it's not the future of procurement itself. And because the value adding um, is, is facilitated by digitalization, it's uh, facilitating freeing up resources to concentrate on more strategic topics and um, with the key function of, of procurement really being bringing in or being the, the interface between supply markets and, and internal stakeholders, um, I think innovation is, is critical, agility is critical, especially in these days where um, yeah, procurement is, I think, mainly busy uh, fill, filling gaps in, 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 um, in your warehouses. And last but not least, of course, um, Resilience or more closely uh, sustainability is also a key topic where um, procurement can take on the driver's seat for the whole company. Because in the end, most companies have their own operations under control when it comes to sustainability, but it's the supply chain and the suppliers in, in probably low cost countries which cause the most headache concerning sustainability. So to sum up, it's I think it's all important topics. Um, I think digitalization is a key one to enable and free up resources for focusing on the other two or three. But it's hard to say that there's one that stands out uh, uh, amongst the others, especially if it's valid for all companies. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I would agree with that. I mean, I'm I am a big 
proponent of digitalization and, and introducing technology, but we have a saying in English that you can't put lipstick onto a pig and expect it to look beautiful. And it's the same in, in this context, because if you have this really expensive piece of technology and you put it into an organization that doesn't have the right people or that has broken processes or that's just you know, very technocratic and, and bureaucracy driven rather than agile and innovative, then 100 percent. I can I completely agree with that. The soft skills then also come into this, though, don't they? And this is sort of going into what you talk and lecture about a lot, because almost you know, psychology and knowledge of marketing and sales principles, I think is becoming more and more important to procurement professionals because we are, like it or not, we are all selling in some way. If, we, if we've got a process or a category strategy or, you know, something like that that we need to bring into the organization, we, like it or not, have to be good salespeople and have to, and have, to have the emotional intelligence, the psychological knowledge, the, 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 the sort of sales and marketing skills to be able to do that successfully. It's uh, even if it's something that's being in, endorsed from the top down, you still need to have those skills to, to push it through and to actually implement it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, I was just smiling because um, I think it's, I hope it's one of the, the, it was a compliment that was one of my colleagues who said, Florian, your thinking is so much marketing driven, uh, you could even work in, in marketing and well knowing that I'm a, I'm a procurement enthusiast. And I think it's very important for us that, that, that we think of procurement as a service, not, not as a servant but as a service to, to internal stakeholders, also to suppliers. And um, I think that if you think about who, who works in procurement right now, that there's a, a lot of people who went into this profession by chance, as you just said, or maybe they ju were just looking for a, for a clerical job or um, coming on to my Star Wars um, Pure Evil Darth Vader t-shirt. Um, procurement in many ways is still an image of, of being the bad guy or the one that squeezes suppliers for, for their, their last pocket money. And um, that's the thing. And that's also the thing why I, what I try to bring into my lectures and to, into my consulting engagements is procurement is a service um, to, to other stakeholders. It's, it's simply clear. They are, they are the, but they are the experts towards the supply markets. And of course, we need uh, to rethink of what skills procurement um, managers of the future need to bring along uh, in order to, to make this change happen, to be accepted with Within the company, not only as a yeah delivering savings or squeezing suppliers, but in the end, uh, really adding value to the to the overall corporation. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, and I think for anyone that that comes from a working environment or a working culture in in a company that's been very that's that's viewed from procurement as being very much the policeman type of function. That's that's going to be especially hard, isn't it? Especially maybe if someone's perhaps a little bit older or a little bit further on in their career and a, a little bit less inclined to change. You know, if I, you, you're based in Germany, especially in somewhere like Germany, because of the labor laws there, it makes it very, very hard to fire underperforming employees. And, and likewise, business culture is relatively conservative in terms of you know, openness to change. I mean, that is changing slowly, especially with the younger generation coming in. But how would you approach that then? If you've got someone that's maybe in their late 40s, early 50s, that's that's very much been used to this very process-driven mindset of procurement being, you know, the policeman that that that, that checks and says no, you can't, or that or or that just pushes paper. Changing from that to be more of a emotionally intelligent driven or sort of psychology driven, you know, trying to trying to sell what they're doing to an internal customer almost, it is a very different mindset, isn't it? So how would you perhaps go about that as a leader? Yeah, maybe it's Starting off because you said something of procurement being rather the police, internal poli police or the compliance department to many. I think it's a very good starting point to rethink the positioning of procurement, first of all, because um, if you need to enforce your uh, internal uh, stakeholders uh, with or, or force them with regulations, guidelines, compliance audits or something like this if they're, they're using the wrong process or something like this or using the wrong hotel when they're booking one or something 
it also describes that you haven't done a proper job from a procurement side because you have not provided the solution that the demand car carrier internally really wanted. Um, and if you if you can convince them and say, well, think about it. If you book the wrong, uh, go, go the wrong track, use the wrong process, or book something that's too too expensive, then it's hurting the company. So it's hurting all of us. Yeah. So it's it's it shouldn't be about you know pointing out guidelines, but about convincing stakeholders. And of course, uh, James, uh, you, you will need some change in, in the skill set here. Um, to be honest, I, I thought about this question beforehand, and there is no short term solution, of course. Yeah, there's not uh, like a magic trick that you can run. From my experience and from, from my consulting projects, uh, the way to go is, is, is have a clear idea of what you want to change within procurement, why you want to change it. Yeah, that could be leadership, could be also driven from, from the employees, why you want to change it um, and, and probably align it better to the company goals, because then you have a very compelling story. If you tell people, if it's stakeholders, if it's employees, we thought about what's our company's goals and what the procurement goals should be. And we now see that there's a mismatch then no one could uh, refuse your, your impulse to change when if you say, well, if we're doing this for the better of the company. Yeah? Who, who should say, no, I don't want the good things for the company to happen. Yeah? So it's really just convincing people. And in the rather short run, it's about convincing a few people at first, you, usually in all of your teams, we have someone, some key users, some persons who really dig into procurement, who love to change things um, and, and yeah, really are mot internally or uh, intrinsically motivated to change something within procurement. And start with them. Yeah, you cannot fire all of your, your, your staff. It's not probably not only in Germany. In the long run, of course, you can, can try to, to uh, change the structure of your team, probably face people in that, that have a different procurement mindset. But even for that, you need to make procurement, sorry to say, so sexy. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Not, the, the yeah. more positive the image of procurement is, the and justifiably positive image of procurement there is, the easier it will be to attract talent. And the more um, skilled and, and motivated talent you're attracting, most probably uh, the change will happen. And you touched on a couple it, of things there that, yeah. that, that I, I would maybe dig into a little bit more. The one is around aligning procurement objectives with the business and making sure that you're all that you're all rowing in the in the same boat because i've certainly been personally in my career in 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 companies where procurement have had targets and we've got frustrated because the business hasn't really embraced that and we've realized that there was very there was a big misalignment between what we were being asked to do and and the direction that the business was going uh, was going down and there was there was not really, for example, a big desire from the business to rationalize the number of suppliers that we were using or to or, or to or to or to move towards lower cost countries for, for sources of supply and that type of thing. So I think that is a really big one. I think the other one is if you've if you're trying to get support and, and get people on board, you're right, you can't do it. You can't do it overnight. I mean, when we if we look at the fall of the Soviet Union and how they tried to you know, switch their economy pretty much overnight from a communist or, or, or centrally planned economy to a capitalist system. And it failed because they, they tried to do everything so quickly. The same kind of applies with digitization or, or digital, digitalization of a complete department or, or complete company that you almost have to do baby steps. And if you, if you try and bring in a completely new team and completely new, new methods, you you are going to fail because you need that continuity. Someone that understands, I guess, the the way that the, what makes the company tick, the company culture. It, it all goes hand in hand, which sort of kind of gets us back to the whole, you know, psychology and people skills around being able to gauge the pace of change that is a, you know, that's fast enough to be able to get you to where you need to be, but is is slow enough to make sure that you're carrying most of the people with you, and that's a very delicate balance, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, again, uh, the, the point, and, and I'm glad that you, that you agree on that. The point of of aligning your your procurement uh, towards the overall company also helps you in in finding that balance. Because think about a really traditional company that uh, you know has has attacked or has tackled change 
uh, in a very let's say comfortable way for employees beforehand and 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 there you need to you need to take an, a different pace or and then if you go to a startup company for example where you say well ch change is part of our daily business yeah so and and, and that bringing that down to to, to a relative simple formula and balancing this out is again looking at your company what is it your company needs in terms of digitalization agility resilience and, and innovation and then your company goals or aligning procurement to your company goals will tell you at what uh, degree you need this yeah so none of the four co core values I, I described for or used to describe future of procurement none of these is is is, is as is a self value yeah so or a value by its own it's only really adding value if it's required by the company yeah? and the more uh, innovation a company requires probably the more it's also prone to 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 accept it or embrace it and, and the less well then you need to take smaller steps towards this how would you how would you sort of evaluate that in terms of the push factors as well in, in low margin industries you know, they kind of need to do all this stuff faster than very profitable industries, but often they're the most conservative when it comes to change. You know, I'm thinking more traditional manufacturing industries where the margins are lower. And then you look at things like fintech that makes a lot of money and they're, you know, some of the most innovative companies out there. Well, to be honest, I have not um, have not had this case in in in, uh, in in the past. Maybe it's a it's 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 one of the aspects of working in consultancy because usually it takes some investment before you get asked to 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 support the transformation of a procurement function. My experience yeah. was rather that I was hired by either more traditional uh, companies um, that uh, had some uh, resources that could uh, finance such a transformation even if it sounds like it costs a fortune, which it does, of course, not. But I think, again, it's really a balancing act here. If without addressing change, you will not have any change for the better. And your margin most probably will go even small transformations do require some sort of investment. Uh, and that doesn't have to be consultancy, but it has to be freeing up your, your people, your employees in the procurement department, in the IT department, to allow them to provide some changes in whether it's, it's the IT system landscape or it's the procurement processes or the procurement marketing itself. So even there, I think you can find some alignment between the company goals and the procurement goals. Because if you say, well, if we stay this misaligned, uh, our profitability, our margins will decrease even further. And on the other hand, um, okay, uh, we now know we are aligning our goals to, uh, to, to the overall company goals more closely. And by doing so, we also uh, probably need to uh, have a more rapid approach uh, to change the strategy because in the end, it's part of the, uh, the company overall strategic direction. But no magic solution here, to, to be fair. Yeah, there's never a magic solution, is it? If there was, then life would be easy. <laughs> well, my, I, I taught my students how to uh, procure the Death Star from Star Wars. Um, <laughs> even there, we found a magic fix. But no, to be, to, to be totally honest and serious, of course, no, there's n never a magic solution. Let's take the example of, of mobile phones and the, and the adoption of, of mobile phones as a, as a technology, as, as sort of a daily tool that we, that we use in our lives. If we take the example of mobile phone adoption in less developed countries, specifically in, in, in African countries, you know, they've gone from not having a functioning fixed line telecommunication system to, to really adapt, uh, adopting mobile technology really, really rapidly and, 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 and have embraced it. And if you look at, if you look at you know, for example, mobile payments in places like Kenya is way more advanced than it is in, in, in many European countries. Do you think the same could be said if we take that sort of analogy and bring it into procurement? Could companies that have still got very immature procurement teams almost be at an advantage because you know that the, the 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 organizations that have already got some level of maturity are going to have to sort of relearn procurement in some way in terms of bringing in and utilizing all of this technology and and forgetting a lot of their bad practices around you know procurement just being an ordering and supply chain and and, and policeman function. I really uh, thought about uh, this uh, w while you were were asking the question, and I think it's possible. 
but uh, to, to make a jump from, let's say, zero to hero or something like this, but uh, only under very specific conditions. So um, I think there's nothing wrong about ambition, but as I said before, it, it should the, the, the speed of your transformation should be adjusted or aligned with, with the ability of the organization to accept this kind of change. So I actually have uh, one, one of our colleagues, uh, he's head of procurement, and um, he really brought uh, procurement from, from zero to hero, let's say from 1.0 to 4.0 in two, three years time. But he had an attrition of over 90% in this. Yeah, so uh, there, to do it with the same people, to be honest, such a drastic change uh, seems close to impossible for me. But yeah, but even so, it's still almost like, you know, you have to keep some of the core of the team on uh, with you. Otherwise, it could potentially explode, implode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, as I said, it has to be very specific conditions under which uh, this could work. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm not even sure. I mean, in the in the end, it comes down to why would you want to do such a thing? It, 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 such a drastic uh, change, is it necessary? Is it part of your, is it aligned to your corporate goals? And in most cases, um, will not be, it would not be. So why why push the change so hard if, if it's not in alignment with what the company is all about, really? So I, it's not, I'm not trying to advocate for, for a slow change all the time, but um, a, a change that, also fits uh, the, the the cultural speed of of transformation within the organization or the culture itself. Yeah. So it's again, it's as you said before, uh, it's always about the the good old saying of of strategy strategy following structure and, and structure following strategy. And in the end, culture eats it all for breakfast, right? So um, I think it's very important to to align what you want, what you think is necessary to make the organization and procurement successful. And once you have this aligned, uh, I think you can also adjust the the speed of transformation to to what the the organization is able to handle, yeah, or the team is able to handle. So let's move on then to the second part of this discussion. And this is around some of the threats and some of the opportunities that Procurement 4.0 will, will bring and looking at, you know, what, what will procurement teams of the future look like? How will the people factor come into the into the bigger picture? Because on the on the one hand, you've got, you know, you, you need the subject matter and the project delivery competence, which I think have been sort of more traditional procurement skills. And then we've got the social and sort of personal growth mindset slash competence that is going to be sort of more important in the future. And by that, I, I, I don't mean that everyone should come in with the ambition to be the next Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, but uh, I think person, personal growth and, and becoming or having a bit more, being a bit more self-aware perhaps about the direction that you want to take your career in rather than just swimming with the current I certainly think that will become more of a thing. And certainly I think now when I speak to younger people and I had the pleasure actually of speaking to one of your students who interviewed me, but they, they seem to be a lot more aware of their own sort of personal strengths and weaknesses than I certainly did when I was in my, my early twenties. And is, is that something that you think the younger generation are just generally better at because they've they've learned more about it as part of their education and just growing up in the in the digital age well and oh that's a tricky one um I, i'm generally speaking i'm not a fan of generalization so um so, so i wouldn't say necessarily that's an age thing because i have Hundreds of students a year, and not not all of them are that self-aware, to be honest, and self-critical yeah. and, and and analytical. And also, there are uh, senior procurement executives I've, I've met, and I uh, with some of them I had the pleasure pleasure working with over a few years, and they are you know running towards their their retirement, and still they say, well, I still want to run a, a full-blown procurement transformation because I think it's important for us. Yeah, so it's 
for me to 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 use the simple formula of age i don't think it will work but i'm pretty certain that what you said that the the psychological level the psychological of skills of procurement people need to broaden yeah so it's not only about reading minds in in a negotiation and be the tough guy or girl in a negotiation but nowadays it's really for me more customer orientation for example so um uh, and, and probably some of the students uh, are more open to this but on the other hand as i say i sometimes i, I get the feeling that they th have the feeling that i'm the uh, their servant or the service employee to them and 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 i'm the one who needs to do the magic show so that they are willing to learn yeah and so yeah i think am ambition and and drive and, and motivation is still a, a key personal i wouldn't call it skill but a key uh, uh, personal characteristic that's very important uh, in, in procurement careers and are you seeing then that some of the professional bodies are, are they moving towards bringing this into their syllabus and into their teaching materials because they they've always been strong on the sort of pro process led sort of qualifications or certainly you know sips that i'm sort of more familiar with you know coming originally from the uk uh, I guess BME is essentially the the German language equivalent, and and ISM in North America. Are they are they starting to bring this in? Are they recognizing that this is going to be a big factor in terms of success of a procurement professional in the future? Well, well if we take uh, the number of requests for for trainings to hold, I get is is an indicator for this. No, there is not that much of a change here. <laughs> I think it's. I mean, it's it's. it's these uh, bodies, uh, BME, SIPs, or, or else, um, are also a reflection of, of procurement, uh, the, the procurement community. And not, not all of it, of course, but uh, they are part of this community. And, and part of this community, part of this is, is probably traditional uh, managers. Um, who think uh, having a training on, on uh, let's say, the 10th training on negotiation skills is more important than one on customer orientation. Yeah, And if your head of procurement uh, thinks that way, uh, it's probably difficult to, to get a training slot or training budget as an employee, even if you think it would be relevant for you. Yeah, So um, to be honest, I do not see this kind of reflection yet, uh, but I see some sort of change Yeah, because as you said in the beginning we've established a study program in munich and this is not an advertising because it's a free program as most uh, university programs in germany but now we have uh, in in the second year of running this program and the request from from our uh, company partners is is really not uh, probably skyrocketing rocketing is too much but uh, the more we are you know getting to known uh, in in the community procurement community the, the more we requests we get, okay, we have an internship here, we have an entry level job there. Uh, could you support us finding some someone? And by now, I think we we have more requests for and open positions than than actually persons who can fill it. Yeah, so uh, the the tide may be changing, but on the other hand, I, I'm also saying I published uh, uh, in in an article about the study program two years ago, and the the, the paper where I published it is Beschaffung Aktuell is like the most common uh, journal in, in on procurement in, in Germany. And uh, I got one or two requests uh, following that article. So if I'm a pro head of procurement who wants to drive change, um, <laughs> it, it's just, as I say, I'm selling nothing here. It's really for free. Um, and, and still I got just one or two requests. And actually one was from a consultant, uh, which is still a very, uh, very uh, kind supporter of our study program but um, in the end I, I sometimes think okay you want change you want different skills you want um, more motivated talent in your in your team but I think it's up to each and every one in procurement uh, to make procurement more attractive and once you do that uh, probably um, yeah slots and 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 qualifications will will fill themselves because people want to learn about it and probably if they come with the right mindset so open to change drivers uh, with a high motivation then probably the procurement skill set knowing about negotiations developing strategies and, and maybe writing orders is the easier part to learn i think rather than um to to upskill people who do not think empathy and and customer orientation are are important in procurement 
That's incredible that you that you published an article in the most popular journal in, in in German language on on procurement and supply, and and so few people reached out to you. I I find that astounding. <laughs> I don't know if I if I was head of procurement and I had a team that I knew that I had to carry on a journey, I wouldn't send them on the. In fact, honestly, the first thing I would do would be would be cancel the annual negotiation training, save the ten thousand euro, and just stick them in the same conference room mm -hmm. as as all of our sales team for, for a day and just let them talk to each other and, and understand a little bit about, about each other's problems because there, there is, just, just like there are a lot of similarities between sales and dating, there are a lot of similarities between sales and procurement as well. It's, yeah. I, I truly believe that, that we, should, yeah. we could learn so much from each other if just company internally we spoke to one another more. Yeah, but but on the end, before it sounds like bashing because, you know, I'm, I'm uh, on a your track i can try once as a professor but i think uh, for many the um, scarcity of resources and not skills but resources is is really a tough one yeah so for example uh, think about the last half year or year where where all um, the bottlenecks in, in chips or shortages and in, in microchips production in wood production and so on and and, and so on and and price increases yeah with the tight uh, resources most procurement teams have it's simply sometimes a matter of prioritization that you think well i, I really would love to spend some time uh, in university recruiting stuff uh, for my procurement team but i have to cancel um because uh, simply there's uh, there's two answers i have to my ceo is saying okay uh, we have shortages and i nonetheless uh, spend my time in university recruiting people um, and, and, and in most cases, when you have a shortage, you have to focus on that one. And again, it's again, it's about balancing, yeah. Yeah? Le learning how to balance the long term improvement and development of procurement and still um, managing to to yeah fulfill your daily tasks and, and goals, of course. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. And and yeah, procurement has always been traditionally quite quite a leanly staffed function, shall we say. <laughs> They've not had the same resources sales have had, rightly or wrongly. And and yeah, I think resources, uh, and especially with COVID, if people have been off sick as well, adding to that, then then yeah, it's um it is definitely it is definitely a challenge. I'm gonna ask you a very controversial question now. Should companies sure. be more like football clubs and be less rigid when it comes to salaries? You know, if you look at the if you look at the big super performing football clubs when they when 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 they break their budget to start to sign the latest superstar, should should companies be like be more like that? Should someone that's twice as productive earn twice as much? Well, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, well, if I think about the recent signing of Bayern Munich, um, probably yes. But uh, <laughs> on a serious, more serious note, probably again, there is uh, a no simple answer to this. I mean, um, maybe let's put it that way. In most companies, I think s seniority is the decisive factor on, on how much you earn. And probably it should not be the, the sole one. Because, as you say, uh, sometimes the young guns, so to speak, uh, can be very productive and probably they should earn their way. On the other hand, uh, seniors, of course, with all their experience, can do uh, very, very much in very little time and, and being very productive. Um, so I think there is no... No, no, uh, and <laughs> comparison to procurement is maybe also difficult because in procurement, uh, you you have to take on your team very much longer than probably uh, maximizing not even profit but success uh, on a very short uh, sh short time scale, and then probably the if if the, the your team drops in performance after a few years you just accept it as a matter of fact whereas in procurement you cannot just accept okay the good times are over and and we we stop being a good procurement department i guess but as i say to me seniority should not be the decisive only especially not only decisive factor in in uh in, in determining what what the salary should be on the other and and especially in football clubs uh, to to take that similarity again when you're you you're past your your best time um you also stop stop earning uh, as much yeah so uh, some sort of pe performance orientation of course should be uh, taken into consideration when when attracting talent in procurement
because in the end, I think it's it's a quite simple formula, and I don't know whether that's uh, in the UK or other countries in in the same in, in Europe, but in in Germany we 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 have an aging population. We think that the the skilled uh, labor base is is getting smaller and smaller. And when companies are complaining that they are not finding the right talent or not finding enough talent, I think if you pay them more, usually you will not have a, a problem to attract talent. Yeah? In the end, it's a competition about the most skilled yeah. team or the skilled workers in a team. And if you pay them well and treat them well, I probably there is no shortage at all. Yeah, and I, I was being maybe a little bit simplistic in the way that I asked the question, deliberately, deliberately provocative. But as a general concept, I, I certainly think that it's much more commonplace in sales to reward the top performers than it is in procurement, and um, and and perhaps you know something more along those lines. I'm not necessarily saying cut the salaries of the underperformers and double the salaries of the superstars, but to, to align it maybe a little bit more with sales. Again, it's always more difficult to prove savings and know who, inst who initiated it. Is it real? Whereas new, whereas, whereas winning sales accounts is, is easier to, is, is sort of easier to evaluate and uh, against performance, I guess. But yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly an interesting one. And I think, and it leads me nicely onto the next thing that I wanted to ask you around talent I think that may be something that will become more of a thing in the future. If we stick on the point of talent, and you you alluded to it in the last question, specifically around Germany and shortage of talent because of you know older people retiring and there not being as many new people entering the workforce, this is going to be something that isn't going to go away. It's going to get worse before it gets better. If mm. we stay on also the subject of football clubs, you know they certainly some of the the longer term most successful football clubs have had very successful academies where they've brought their youth players through uh, and sort of ingrained them into the culture and made them into into first team very successful first team players if you look at barcelona or manchester united i guess bayern munich in in germany do you think that could be a model that will become more common where where large companies will maybe partner with universities and pick out some of the brightest students to join their academy and and perhaps work for them as interns while they're students to to to, to really sort of coach them into their their company culture and and encourage them to take a job at the end of their studies uh, definitely when i think about the transformation programs i accompanied usually change management, skilling up people, especially in, in the digitalization field is kind of somewhere on the bucket list, but not necessarily high enough there. Yeah? So training, I think, is, is an, or training and skill and change management is, skill management is, is probably the number one problem for, for transformations to run successfully or not. So even if you don't take the long run, um, I think it's always key to, to consider um developing the skills of your your employees i think probably in procurement which and, and i find the procurement uh, the, the football analogy uh, quite a, a good match here is the problem is in procurement with the tight resources i think many procurement managers are reluctant to invest more um, in the long-term development of, of or partnership with with academia because they think well if uh, then i invest money time and resources um to to develop the undergraduates and once they get graduates they either ask for silly high salaries or the really big companies jump in and then just you put on 10 percent and then they're gone and i invested so many years developing them yeah so it's more like uh, i think it's some of the procurement managers have experienced this so they are probably more reluctant to do it but in the end it really doesn't help it and i, I spoke to one of of my colleagues from the bme so the the uh, german procurement association and he said well it's unfortunate but rather than having no skilled procurement people at all i rather uh, hire them as young guns um, develop them with the risk of them being uh, fetched by the the big fishes after a few years rather than not having them at all and having the chance of motivating them and showing them development pathways and career pathways. And of course, in the end, some more money. 
with a chance of retaining them. Yeah. So probably as, as, as in many cases, if you don't do anything at all, it is most likely not to solve your problem at all. Yeah. So if you try and risk, yeah, and try developing people and risk of them being hired by the big fishes. Okay. That's part of the deal, part of the competition, but it's certainly better to try it and, and having the opportunity to retain the talent than not recruiting it at all. Yeah, and I and I think that's a really valid point because I think that especially not exclusively, but especially you know with people entering the workforce now or, or who are just a few years into their career. If I think about the more younger generation, this seems to be a trend towards wanting to do more rewarding work. And I know you said earlier you hate generalizations, and this kind of is one as well, I guess, but. I do see on the one hand, people want to have enough money to be able to live comfortably. And if if a, if a company is paying a salary, that means that the that, that means that the team member is paying half of their net salary on rent, then obviously, you know, there's there's not much motivation for them to stay within that company for uh, and, and grow within it if they're not going to see that change. But I, I see an increasing trend now that people aren't going to just jump ship for a, for, for another 5,000 euro in salary if if the job's going to be the same and the same things that irritated them about their previous employer are going to be present there. And it's certainly now, I mean, I'm in my early 40s, but if I was 10 years younger and I'd reached that point that I'd got a few years, perhaps experience as a category manager in my early 30s, I would now be, re- knowing what I know now, I would be really open to go and work for one of these procurement technology startups and maybe sort of see how things work on on the other side, even if it meant in the short term I had to take a drop in salary because the the growth potential of working for a startup and seeing it grow and and just being part of that structure from from the early days, I think is just, it's so inspiring and it just, you would learn so much in one or two years that would probably take you five plus years to learn in a in a major corporation with all of that process and bureaucracy around you and you know all of the other people that are you know fighting for the same position yeah i mean nothing i can add here really i'm 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 totally convinced uh, that that you're right here I myself, I was a, let's say, reasonably successful consultant before I chose to go back to university and add another four years of my PhD program with, of course, much uh, yeah. by far less money and uh, I never regret it. Yeah. So because it, I learned so much and of course, being in, in my dream career right now, the, the, the step back uh, financially was uh, was a uh, hundred steps forwards in in everything else I never thought I would even be able to achieve, yeah. And I think in in general, and so that pays on to to the generalization or not generalization of things is, I think it's never one factor that motivates people or drives people in their workplaces. And then this is what I learned in my previous employment as a as a consultant. Is was there are certain categories of which drives you in work. Is it culture? Is it people is it money is it fame is it content or something and you you every year we needed to pr- prioritize how uh, how important is it and how satisfied are we and um this changes over time even that yeah so probably as a young young student or young graduate you think well i go in for the money for two three years now and then i realize it's not satisfactory at all i totally change directions and and and, and do pro bono work could be yeah so i think it's always important to have in in mind and reflect individually what's important for me and then go for it my final question i just realized we've been live for almost 50 minutes time flies when you're enjoying yourselves um with the trend that's happening and i've spoken a lot about this on the podcast as well about sort of entry level and tactical roles in the future will be predominantly automated and and eliminated what do you think that will mean for new graduates? So if, if what advice are you giving to your students now that are coming into the profession in a time where, you know, certainly in the more forward thinking companies in three to five years, these roles won't exist that typically me and you would have gone into sort of circa 20 years ago at the start of our careers. 
Who, um, what would I tell them? I mean, to be honest, with now uh, around seven years as a professor and even longer as a as a lecturer, I realized that sometimes uh, because the content stays quite the same, the people are changing, and the younger people nowadays they don't know the old days, so to speak. They probably will not miss typing orders or something because they are quite adapting to to what they know right now yeah so when i tell them something in a lecture and say well 20 years ago it was like this and that they don't even care and why should they i think it's important oh, to I know know. where where <laughs> things are coming from why they are the way they are that they are right now but in the end i think is um on, on to each and every one of them uh, to to either realize uh, what has been the past or, or they don't. For us at the university, and especially for me in the courses I'm working on or under lecturing, I try to find that focus as well. Yeah, I try to look into the future of procurement, which I probably fail uh, as well. But I think it um, will be more conceptual work, less clerical work. And this is something I try uh, to integrate and I do integrate into my daily lectures. I say, well, it's no longer about typing orders and I will not teach you even in my procurement fundamentals course, I will not teach you how to type an order. I will teach you how to develop a strategy and how to align it and uh, how to look outside into the market and how to how to work with suppliers. So there is definitely a change in skills, but I think it's uh, not that big of a deal because if they now learn, young people now learn what the, the skills of the future will be or the, that will be more important from now on, they are not that much missing out on, on the skills that have been here for the last 20 years or something. That's a great answer, actually. And I've got an example from the real life that can sort of help to cement that. I, I recently had to explain to someone that was born in 1991 who Sonic the Hedgehog was, and it made me feel really, really old. So, <laughs> yeah, I kind of, uh, I kind of get that that they may not even have any any experience of what of what placing an order even is. So, yeah. So if anyone would like to find out a little bit more about you or maybe get a copy of one of the four books that you've written, uh, if they speak German, uh, then what's the best place that they can get hold of you? Well, uh, I'm listed in all of the um, major bookstores and, and the one that starts with an A as well. I think uh, the most fun way would be if you, they just hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, just as we did, and and yeah, get to know each other, get uh, an opportunity to chat, and and as you said, it's been a pleasure, and and probably if we had some beer, we could go on uh, talking about this topic for another hour or so. And maybe we can do that if uh, if we both manage to get to Procurement Summit this year. Would love to. Florian, thank yeah, you very much forward. for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. You are a fountain of knowledge on this topic. And uh, it's been great to, to catch up and uh, and pick your brain on, on what's happening in this space. If anyone's wondering what my T-shirt says, uh, this is my new business venture, which is going to be launching hopefully in a few weeks' time, which will be sort of around about end of February for anyone who's listening to this on the podcast Go to procurementsoftware.site if you want to sign up for updates as we get closer to launch. Uh, it will help a lot of people out there who want to get a little bit more knowledge about the procurement technology market, but don't have the hours and hours of resources to Google all of the different suppliers in what, what is right now a very crowded and a very busy market with lots of innovation. So, uh, yeah, Florian, thank you. Keep in touch and uh, all the best. Thank you so much. It was an honor and a pleasure. Bye-bye.